Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to bring back a very special guest, Martin Lipton from the Sun newspaper, of course, chief uh, sports reporter at the Sun. Martin, great to have you back. How are you? Um, a bit frazzled today. I've been a, I spent the day at Heathrow uh, an IFAB meeting, but that's what, what we do in this job. So we end up talking to people in suits about people who kick balls around. That's the nature of the job. Well, you're here to talk about Tottenham Hotspur, of course, our beloved Tottenham Hotspur. Um, I'm going to start, Martin, with the news. Of course, uh, Rodrigo Benson Kerr is now out for another two and a half months, expected to be back mid-Feb. Um, very simply, are Spurs cursed? It feels that way, doesn't it? I mean, it is horrific. There's, I think there's 11 players out at the moment Yeah, uh, through injury and suspension, which is quite literally a full team. And it would be quite a decent team as well, looking at it. Yeah. But it's our part of, of football. Um, look, it was a poor tackle by Cash, no question. Uh, but it's only ever a yellow card. And he, it's one of those where you get up and no one even thinks about it afterwards. It was unfortunate that the injury was sustained. But injuries happen. And it's a shame because he was looking like he was getting back to fitness. He was controlling the game. And if he stays on the pitch, I think Spurs probably win. Not definitely win because... They had, you know, Emerson and Davis the centre half, and that was um, a bigger contributory factor than anything else. That the, the players on the pitch weren't as good as the ones that were not on the pitch, unfortunately. And it's a real yeah. shame the player who's been out for so long just got back. But you've got to get on with it. There's no point in moping about it, and the manager won't mope about it, and the other players can't afford to mope about it. It's really frustrating. And get on with getting ready for, for City and what follows after that. Martin, in terms of injuries, as you said, 11 players out. Saar, Van der Ven, Phillips, Solomon, Sessegnon, Perisic, Madison, Richarlison, Benton Kerr, Whiteman. And of course, Romero is suspended for the City game on Sunday. Um, but Thuma is, 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 of course, back. How do Spurs um, move on from so many injuries? And, and dare I say, if we get one or two more... We are literally at bare bones. You know, we've got a, we've got seven games coming up in December, a very, very busy month. Um, and of course, because we haven't been playing European football this season, we've only been playing one game a week. This is a very, very busy December. Um, Poster Coglu is trying to give absolutely everything. We saw on Sunday, he played two right backs, two left backs, no defensive uh, midfielders. Benson Kerr come back for his first start. The Celso, uh, his first start of the season. Brian Hill was back as well. Um, how do you see December going in particular? It is the longest month because it's so dark and it's going to feel like the darkest month as well, just because of the, the, the wear and tear on the, on the squad. We, you know, when you're going into the season, it was a 15-man squad. The trouble is that you know five or six starting players are out. And if you take five or six starters out of any team, including Manchester City, they would struggle. And they've got depth. And Tottenham haven't got the depth that some of these other teams have got. And we've known that for quite some time. And you can't make build depth in one window. So what you have to do is be, at some point, I suspect, we're going to see some of those very promising young kids being thrown in a bit ahead of time, um, which is not ideal because you don't want them to go in too deep into the pool in case they can't swim in it. And it could have a knock-on effect for them long term. Or they absolutely get, get it, thrive, and suddenly to start their career. You never, never quite know. But you wouldn't necessarily want to have to throw them in. And I suspect with another couple of injuries, there will, no be, will, will be no option because there won't be any, any other players. Um, and that is the, the, the state we're getting to at the moment. You know, you've got to add in the likelihood of suspensions as well because the, the players will make tired tackles because yeah. they're playing so many games and because they're having to play 90 minutes where maybe early in the season he might have taken a couple off after 65, 70, all of these factors. Um, it's going to be a really tough month. There's no question about that. Martin, how were you feeling after the first 10 games of the season when Spurs were sitting top of the league? Because we all felt, every single Spurs fan, I think, felt that an injury or two to one or two key players, it could derail our season. But, you know, the way that that Chelsea game went, um, you know, injury, suspensions, um, it's been disastrous after that 10th game, hasn't it? Oh, it has. But some of it was self-inflicted. You know, Udogi should have been sent off before he was sent off. Romero deserves to be sent off. Let's not pretend otherwise. Let's not try and cry about decisions. I'm sick of managers, any manager, moaning about decisions. The one I can get exception, actually, is Gary O'Neill, because he's been absolutely dumb blind 
on five occasions this season. But most managers get a bad one and live with it or have to live with it. Stop moaning. Injuries happen. It's been really frustrating. When you lose key players, losing players is one thing. Losing absolutely critical players is a real blow. When you lose all of them at the same time, crikey, uh, it's really difficult. And then, you know, the international curse comes and Saar gets injured as well. Yeah. And Madison's had the operation. And then, you know, Madison got, got done and all of this. It's really tough, unquestionably. And it's a real shame because they started the season far better than I think any of us realistically ex expected, anticipated. And things were looking so bright. I don't think anyone in their right mind was thinking they're going to win the league. It wasn't going to. Well, it was great to be top, but it wasn't going to happen. I thought the key <laughs> to be in contention for top four at the halfway stage. Now, the good thing is because the start was so incredibly good, and it really was, as long as they get some points, you know, 10 points, 12 points over these next seven games, Spurs are right in the mix for the top four, which is or top five, which probably gets a European uh, Champions League place, which was a realistic ambition for the season, because then, albeit that January means Saar and Bissouma go away and Son, so there yeah. has to be reinforcement, simple as that. They have to buy players. It's really important that they do. Um, when you get the first 11 back and have four or five who can come in, there's not a team I'd be worried about playing. I'm not saying they win every game, but they'd have a, they could go on the pitch, you know, from what we've seen already, with a realistic chance. Look, that Chelsea game, if they don't lose their heads, and it all boiled down to Romero going on a ludicrous run down the right flank, and he never got his head back. If they don't lose their heads, they win that game four or five nil. They do. Yeah. Um, but they didn't. And that's what happens. Wolves, they were very poor. Could have won, deserved to lose. Um, Sunday, very different, actually. I came away, you know, watched that game and thought, oh, I played really well. I just lost. Because sometimes you play really well and lose, and sometimes you play really badly and win. You know, sometimes you play averagely and, and win or lose. But that was they played really well, could have scored a hatful. They take the chances. We're not even worried about anything. That Tottenham are joint or one point off top. Let's put it in perspective. That's how 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 fine the margins can be. And it was a really given the changes he had to make. I thought the performance was was excellent apart from finishing. Look, would I have Brian Hill on the pitch? No. I I've still not seen enough to make me think he's a football player at the level we, we require. Um, there wasn't much else he could do at the back. In fact, I thought it was, I said on a, another show last week, that I'd have left Dyer out on Sunday and gone Emerson and Davis, or Emerson and one of the kids, maybe Dorrington, but I think Emerson and Davis made sense because I thought the mood within the ground would be better if Dyer didn't play. And that's no disrespect to Eric Dyer. He's been a fantastic servant. I just think it's time. Uh, the trouble is that someone else who would have gone, Hoberg, probably doesn't go now in January because what have you got in midfield? I think that applies to everyone, doesn't it? Well, but particularly there. Um, yeah. I don't think if, if Dyer's not going to play, there's no point in keeping him. But Hoberg, if he stays, will play because there's no, because there, you know, there's no Saar and no Basuma and there's no Bentancur. So what else have you got? You've got, you've got midfield options to skip. Madison coming back and Kulisevsky. There's not really, a, and, and Lo Celso. So you need to have that body in there. Martin, it's an interesting one with Eric Dyer because, um, of course, he went out um, on pre-season with Postacoglu um, and then not played a minute. And then, of course, uh, the problems in that Chelsea game came on as a sub, you know, to a surprised, you know, Tottenham crowd. You know, I don't think, you know, most people thought that we would never see Dyer in a Spurs shirt again. Uh, and then, of course, he started at Wolves. Then uh, he was back on the bench uh, for the Aston Villa game. What have you made of that situation? Because there are lots of rumours stating that Daniel Levy would rather cash in on Eric Dyer in the January transfer window. Whether that happens now or not because of all these injuries is another thing. Um, but in your opinion, should someone like Phillips, who was fit then, I know he's injured now, but should he have uh, perhaps started that Wolves game? Because... You know, with Postacoglu, you know, having this rebuild, is it about the future or is it, you know, going back to players like this? Well, if you'd asked that question three years ago, it wouldn't have been an issue, would it? You'd have had Dyer in without any problem at all. And he's been a really good servant. I just think it's... But it's the high line. That's that's what I mean. Is well, because... saying, yeah. But it was, they didn't really play with that high line against Wolves, did they? They were dropping off. They actually played differently. They weren't playing the way they, they... The Wolves was the anomaly. This Of all the games they played this season, 
take out Luton because they were a man down. Yeah. Wolves was the one game they didn't play like they played in all the other games. And it didn't work. They may, they nearly got away with it, but it didn't work. So he decided, right, we're going to go back to what we're good at, what I think we can do. And I can't do that with Eric Dyer. So he went with Emerson and, and Davis at the weekend. I think it's, the thing is, what value are you going to get for, I would be honest, I would say to Eric Dyer, if you can find yourself a club in January, we don't want any money for you. You've been a brilliant servant. If you if you if you stay, that's fine. You're in the squad, but let's be honest, you're not going to play much. But if you if you can find somewhere to go, for what you've brought to the team and the club over these nine years, we're not going to ask a, a, a fee. Because is, it, is that not the problem though with Hugo Lloris? Well, it possibly is, but difference being that I think Dyer wants to play. Lloris just wants to do some training, keep himself fit because he doesn't doesn't really care anymore. And he's also he's older, isn't he? He's thirty six. Dyer's a few years younger. And I just think that look, at the end of this season, we know that Lewis is going to go. He's been taking his money. Fine. That's what he wants to do. We He didn't he didn't hold Spurs at gunpoint and give him the contract. You know, he, wasn't, he didn't wear a mask and say, come on, Dan, you'll give it to me. He was offered the contract. He signed it. So the trouble is he's, his time is gone. It, it can happen. And I think over the next 18 months, we're going to see significant changes in that squad. We've got in the next yeah. two, three windows, I think there'll be six or seven long standing players who will leave the club because it's time for that overhaul. But you can't, you've got to do that piecemeal where you can't do it all in one go, particularly when you've got, you know, the manager comes in with only half that window left anyhow. So I think he'll be plotting and planning and thinking already about January and about next summer with the powers that be at the club. And I suspect and hope and anticipate significant changes, all for the better, in that sometimes you need to, you know, cut off the the branch for the tree to thrive. Who are you thinking? Well, Dyer, Davis, Sessignon, Skip, Richarlison. If, if yeah. Saudis come in and bid for Richarlison, cash in, take the money. Because I just don't think it's ever going to work. Really, I'd love it to work. I don't think it's yeah. going to work. Sometimes players just don't, don't work. And it's really a shame because he's obviously a nice boy. But the other players seem to like him. He's, you know, his behaviour off the pitch is actually really, really good. Some of the causes he gets involved with are fantastic. I really want it to, to work. But the longer it goes, the more you think it's not going to work. And it's no one's fault. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. And a player goes somewhere else and suddenly bang. Or they've hit the their moment on the way down and you never see them again. You, you, you just don't know. But I think there needs to be, to be those, those changes. Um, I'm quite happy with Emerson as the cover right back. And want to cover left back until we get one, then you stick with Davis. Because Davis is always the same performance. He's never up there and he's never down there. He's always there. He gives everything. He works really hard. He could have scored on on Sunday, but he also could have got tighter for one of the goals. You know, it's, it's, it is what it is. I mean, it, there's no question about the attitude or the intensity or the effort by those players. Just sometimes you need to move on. I said, in normal circumstances, Hoberg would go in January. But we're, not, yeah. we're in abnormal circumstances for various reasons. So you've got to say, OK, unless you can get three in, you're going to keep him. Realistically, you're going to get three central midfielders in in January. No, you might get one or two. But when two of your of your players, if your starters are going away and a third one's out till the middle of February, you can't afford to let anyone go. Martin, um there's often quite a lot of pressure on Daniel Levy and the board uh, during transfer windows, particularly the January transfer window. Does this injury list now put even more pressure on the board to deliver in January? Because let's face it and let's be very honest about it. You know, those doubters and those people who criticise, they couldn't have criticised the summer transfer window because it was exceptional. And, because, you know, what's, what, what, what's the chances, do you think, again, of having another exceptional window? Well, if you look back two seasons, we only brought in two players, but they were massive players in yeah. Ben Tanker and, and Kulisevsky. This time, for, I would imagine the initial plan was to get in one or two because you don't want to upset the apple cart. You just tweak and then you the bigger changes are in, are in the summer because you can't make radical change normally in January. This time it's different because of those circumstances we've already mentioned that are out with the control of pretty much anybody. Yeah. Uh, and therefore the need, if, if it's just been a normal season without uh, African nations and Asian cup, 
it might have been different. But it isn't. It is what it is. And therefore, there needs to be, whether that be loans or buys or whatever, pushing things forward quicker than might have been, something will have to be done because there's no way that this squad is sufficient to carry Spurs through December and January. There are not enough players. It's clear. Everyone can see that. So there needs to be a greater influx than normal if there's to be a realistic chance of having the quality and depth in the squad to fulfil what the starting eleven is actually capable of. Martin, do you think things will be done differently now under Postacoglu? Because I think the last time you were on, we were under Antonio Conte. Uh, and of course, a lot has changed at the football club. You know, I have journalists like you you, you on, um, you know, on a regular basis. And, you know, when I talk to them and then in the next talk to them, you know, the managers have changed, lots of players have changed, lots of changes at the football club. Um, do you think that things will be different? Because... Antonio Conte, of course, last season said on a number of occasions about club signings. Uh, Postacoglu has said that he wants business done early. Do you think the Spurs will deliver what Postacoglu wants to take this football club forward? Well, even if they don't, he won't blow up the club like his predecessor did. No. So that's a help. That's beneficial. Um, I think that there's enough buy-in and he's got people now around him who, who, who seem to, he seems to be happy with that we'll see those arguments. But because I think they're having those, they have to have those discussions now rather than maybe in a, in a fortnight's time and they might have been just, to, what, what do we actually need next month? Now it's, we really need things next month. We've got to start doing it. We've got to try and get some of them in early as well because the African yeah. nation players go away probably before the third round of the FA Cup, certainly the week of the third round of the FA Cup. So we really, we haven't got any time to, to spare. So there needs to be that that move. I think there'll be, as I say, significant changes. But even if there aren't, this is the job he's always wanted. Not necessarily Tottenham, but a big Premier League club with ambition, with a supporter base, with the possibility of becoming a significant player. He's always wanted that opportunity. He's not going to throw it away. He doesn't believe, unlike Conte, that he's bigger than the club. Yeah. That makes a massive difference. I think it really I, does. You know, the the personality of the manager is exactly what the club required. Yeah, absolutely. Um, totally agree. Um, can I ask you what your opinion was when Postacoglu was appointed? Were you pleased? I was surprised, but I wasn't shocked. It, it was the right sort of profile of manager. No, not necessarily one I'd have expected them to go because I thought they were going to look at, at slot or or someone of, with a continental background who who worked in Europe, knew that market a bit better. Um, but I, I spoke, I took some soundings from people in Scotland and the universal praise for what he did made me think, oh, maybe this is a really good one. Uh, and the people who know him, I think you've talked to, to John Greken, uh, who wrote the book about him, who, and I've known John for... Oh, Crikey, too many years. We worked together at the Mail 25 years ago, and he was telling me what a fantastic bloke he was and what a what a great coach he was. And John John knows his football. So when people tell you that, who you trust and know, who actually seen the bloke up up close and personal, you're willing to give a bit of of leeway and listen to what he has to say. And he said the right things from the first day. He under he was it helped that he'd been at Celtic, slightly cultish thing at Celtic. Um, but he got what the fan, he, he knew what fans wanted to, to hear. He obviously knows what players want to hear. Let's go with it. You know, let's see how, how this ride pays out. But I think it's going to be a, a long ride and I think it's going to be a very exciting ride. And I've got no reason to doubt that. And I think a couple of bumps along the way won't change what is going to be a, a fantastic journey for the club as long as they have the courage to stick with him. And I'm I'm hoping and thinking they will. That's exactly where I was going to go, Martin. It sounds like you've been won over. I've certainly been won over. I know there were a lot of uh, doubters out there in the summer. And, you know, the way that we've started the uh, the Premier League season, the style has been, um, you know, excellent compared to the football that we've seen in recent years. Do you think he's going to be the man to lead Spurs to a trophy? Because, of course, it has been 15 <laughs> long years. I know, I know that is always the million-dollar question. But um, sure, surely the club have got to give someone the time, the tools and you know, everything possible to, to make this happen because it has been so long. Look, if you give him long enough, I'm sure. He's a track record of winning things. 
uh, and his teams tend to improve when he's there rather than getting worse. So let's just see what what he does. But I'm really confident that that will be a this will be a long term investment for four or five years, and the manager will get a team that gets better. And the most important thing of all is you're there every every week. You travel to to the away games. You talk to the fans. You are you know you're there all the time. You know what it's done. You know exactly yeah. what it's done to the entire supporter base and the club and the infrastructure and everything. It's been transformative in a couple of months. That's remarkable. This is why it's such a shame, Martin, because we can all see uh, he's building something really special. He's transformed the fan base. Everyone's smiling again. You know, the fans were singing, we've got our Tottenham back. And then, of course, all of these injuries. And I see on on Twitter, I know Twitter's not the, the greatest place to to get opinions from uh, Spurs fans or, or any other football fans, for that matter. But, you know, there, there are even some doubters now. You know, we, we lose three games on the spin. Uh, but like you said earlier, you know, you watch that Aston Villa game. And we were unlucky not to win it. We created so many chances. Son scored a hat trick. Of course, uh, every decision was uh, was ruled offside. But we can see what's happening. We we can see that we're going forward. Look, Adogi should score. Kulaseski should score. Pollock yeah. should score. Yeah. It wasn't as if we had one shot. Kaiki, yeah. Look, I was watching the game and I said to my son, we've got to score three to win this because we're going to concede two. Unfortunately, I was right. Um, but we didn't score three. But we could have done. We could have scored three in the first 20. Um, and those things can be worked on. Other games, you're going to have those those chances. You win the game easily. So it sometimes happens. You can play, as I said, you can play well and lose. What's really important is that you're trying to play well. That wasn't the case for a few years. It was, yeah. it was a miserable experience going to watch them. Because it was, you know, they'd only play, they did play a tour for 40 minutes and the whole plan was, well, hopefully Son or Kane will, uh, will score us a goal. It was rubbish. It really wasn't any fun. Yeah. Football's supposed to be entertainment. It's supposed to be enjoyment. It's supposed to be a way to get a, what, to get out of the daily struggles of life and, and just have a smile on your face. Well, football like that puts a smile on people's faces and that's that's what I want to see. When you, when you see your fullbacks bombing through at centre forward to miss a really good chance in the first three minutes, you're thinking... Never seen that before. Not a top, yeah. not for a very long time. That's exactly what you want to see. And yes, he will make mistakes. Some of his selections won't work. Some players won't play well. Some of them will have to be bummed out. The ethos is right. The mindset is right. The approach is exactly what you want. High intensity, high press, aggressive front foot football. That is what you want to see. And it's also sometimes you are going to lose. You are going to, you know. That, that old quote about from Bill Nick about, you know, even when you lose, it's about echoes of glory. Well, that's it. That's what it's about, trying to win. I'd rather lose trying to win than lose trying not to lose, which is what we've seen for three or four seasons. Martin, what was your expectation before a ball was kicked in the Premier League season? Because, of course, Harry Kane sold. Spurs changed the whole spine of the team. Vicario in goal. Uh, Van der Ven. Madison, of course, came in. What was your expectation then and what is your expectation now? I thought it would be a rocky start and that it would take at least four or five games for the new signings to acclimatise. I thought we would struggle to score goals without Kane because I wasn't sure whether Son would be back to goal-scoring form or not. And I, I thought that by the end of the season with the manager, there was a good chance of getting into the top six. In six. And I now think that if we get 25 games with the first team on the pitch, we will be yep. good enough to finish in the top four or five. So that's... You mentioned, you mentioned Hun Min Son there. Um, a lot of people after Sunday's game uh, are now saying that Spurs need to go out and sign a striker in the January window and perhaps put Son on the left again. Do you agree with that? I'd like the option. Of uh, of one on the left of of, one, of, a, of a striker, a, a Tony, or or someone of that ilk who can be the nine um, to play to play Son off him. Occasionally play Son again in the middle. Don't you? You, know, you don't want to play every game. You want to. You could do with a, a a thirteen that you rotate regularly or fourteen rather than just eleven. Uh, but there's consistency in that because they're all going to get game time to have something different. Because what we haven't got at the moment is something different. We've only got one way of playing. I mean, it's why I thought he might consider changing it up slightly on, on Sunday and playing Kulisevsky at the top of a diamond 
and getting the whip from the fullbacks just to give Villa something different to look at. The one thing you would say at the moment, when you've only got 11 players that you can put on the pitch, is that it's going to be pretty obvious how they're going to play. If you have yeah. an op- a couple of options to play differently, even if it's only for 20 minutes in a match, that can trans- that can change things. Martin, is it fair to say that uh, James Madison, one of the signings of the summer in the Premier League? Him and Van de Ven have both been outstanding. I mean, that Madison has been everything I thought he could be and more. Uh, yeah. He just wants to play for Tottenham Hotspur. Now, given he's an Arsenal fan, that's even better. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's uh, he really wants to play for Spurs. You can see it's he's he's tapped into the club in a way that very few have. And he's had, he, you know, when he was on the pitch, it was fun to watch him because he was just enjoying himself. He was playing with that that swagger uh, and that sense of devil, but in the right way. And we haven't had a player who can do that for a while. You know, we it take, it's taken the club four years to replace Ericsson. And they've replaced him with an upgrade. It's been a long wait, but it's, you know, he's he's an outstanding football player. And look at his stats already. That's the quality that you're talking about. And the link up he had with all the other players. Absolutely fantastic performance. And that, he's a massive miss, as is, as is Van der Ven. No question yeah. about it. But it's not as if they're out forever. You know, injuries happen. He'll be back maybe around Christmas time. With a point to prove to himself, because he want to say he want to show how much he was missed. Oh, go on then, go and play, son. Go and play. The only thing that worries me, and I try to be uh, a really positive Spurs fan, is the fact that we're not going to have our um, best starting eleven um, available until February. So we're just going to need to try and get through it, because of course, as you mentioned, the uh, the Afcon tournament uh, in January, uh, various players coming back. Um. It's going to be difficult, but we've got to get through it. Um, we what have eight you... or nine as opposed to five. Sorry? We might have eight or nine of our best team as opposed to yeah. five. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it it makes make a big it. difference. No it, you know, yeah. if you get eight or nine on the pitch and you've got yeah. a half back, that's the big thing. If, if Van der Ven comes back fit, it's going to make a, as big a difference as anybody else, probably more so than anybody else, because the whole team is in a different frame of mind. When you've got that yeah. certainty that he'll be able to bail you out with his pace, um, because he's been outstanding. So a few players back, and suddenly everything looks different. And a couple of wins would help as well. You know, let's just get some points on the board. When you have a couple a bad trot, it's hard to get out of it. You need to get results to do that. And you know, and let's be honest, if you were offered anything at City, you'd take it. In fact, you'd probably yeah. offer, you'd probably take a three 0 defeat. In truth, <laughs> because. Look at the team we're putting out. It, if you go with your first team, you lose three or four nil. You're not happy. If you go with half team, and you don't get absolutely busted by one of the best team, arguably the best team in the world. Okay, let's move on and then let's let's get the next the matches that we can get points of. Look, you never know; they could go there, play really well, get a bit of luck, nick a one nil. But realistically, it's going to be a tough afternoon on Sunday. Martin, of course, you're a sports journalist, have been for many years, work for the Sun newspaper. Now, all of us Spurs fans just see that we're cursed and we have all of these issues constantly. Every year, there always just seems to be some sort of issues at the football club. Do other clubs go through the amount of issues that we have? I'm sure they do, but you don't notice it, do you? You know, injuries, things happen. You know, Manchester United, what what a mess they're in at the moment with all the off-field stuff. Two players being at various points banned from the club for indiscretion. Three players banned from the club yeah. for indiscretions. Injuries left. Right. It does happen. You've got to deal with it. There's no point. Yeah. In, there's no point in, oh, God, it's all going wrong. It's all oh, some cut. Get out and play football. Seriously. You can't, you can't change things that have happened. You can only change the things that are going to happen. So there's no point in worrying and moaning about things that, are irreversible. You know, you've got to accept that Van der Ven's out until Christmas and Madison's out until Christmas and Romero's out for one more week. Please don't get sent off again. We really do need you, you know, Christian, if that's okay with you. Uh, you know, things like that. You've just got to got to deal with it and, and ask players to do jobs better than they have before to try and cover the void. And I thought on Sunday, outside of the of the result, that's exactly what they did. Can I ask you about Christian Romero? Because, of course, Messi said recently, one of the best defenders in the world, if not the best. Does he 
does he take that out of his game that that follow through of uh you know the red cards the yellow cards at spurs you know we all know what a great defender he can be does he change his game in some way martin well he didn't have to in the first nine games of the season did he because he he done it he barely committed a foul in the first nine games of the season and he got caught up in the emotion of the night against against Chelsea. I mean, it might be something about Chelsea. Maybe it's something about proving himself to Pochettino, possibly. Fellow Argentine, fellow Argentine centre-half, all of these things. Yeah. Um, and he lost his head. And, you know, the red card came from his appalling clearance. Yeah. He plays short to him from a goal kick. He's got the entire pitch to aim at. Could go short to Poro, could go into whomever he wanted, and he completely scuffed it across the middle of the park because his head wasn't right, because he'd gone on that stupid run five minutes earlier. Uh, sometimes you just got to calm down. You expect your better players to be calmer. He's got to be calmer. He's an important player, and he's no good to anybody sitting in the stands because he's suspended. He's got to be yeah. on the pitch. So it's that, that comes down to him. Nobody other than Christian Romero can make that decision to be concentrated. And if he can do it for nine matches, he, could, he should be able to do it for 10, 11, 12, 13, et cetera, matches. It's on him. Nobody else. Yeah, if looks could kill, I'll tell you what, um, he was looking over at Matty Cash on Sunday when Benson Kerr was going off uh, injured. So uh, I feel sorry for Matty Cash, uh, the return oh, fixture. Of the Cash, Absolutely no sympathy for Matty Cash when, it, when he gets what's coming. Yeah. From whoever, <laughs> look, other players are going to look at him and think, "Well, if I don't, if I, if he, if I don't do him, he's going to do me." That's yeah. from any club. It's not from Tottenham. It's just anyone who's playing Villa. They're going to look at him and think, "Right, he's going to do me." The one, the one way that he won't do me is someone does him first. And I'm sorry, yeah. but that's that's human nature. I don't. I'm not encouraging or arguing for violence on the pitch. No. I just know what the players think. Yeah. Well, exactly. Um, Martin, what after the start that we've had? And now with the injuries that we've got, in your opinion, what would be a successful season for Tottenham? Still top five. That's the measure of success. Getting into top four, definitely in Champions League. We know fifth, probably. We don't know for certain. We won't know whether fifth is Champions League place or not until early April, actually, when we know who's left in the in Europe and how many points they can get. And it's based on the top two uh, performing nations in Europe over the average number of points they get across all their competing clubs. But Eng England have got City, that lot up the road, already affect both through effectively. One is and one will be in the Champions League. Liverpool are going to go deep. Villa will go deep in the Conference League because they're a very good team. And I've always felt they were a real threat this season. They proved it again on, on Sunday. West Ham will go pretty deep in the Europa League. So all of those points add up and actually benefit Spurs potentially. Um and that's got to be the target. Champions League football, again. It's a, top, a club like Tottenham should always qualify for Europe. There's no excuse. I, because... yeah, I, was going to ask, I was going to ask you about the European competition because, of course, we're not planning Europe. Um, I hate that because I love a European away day. Um, for me, and I, and I know I'm in the minority here, I wanted Spurs to compete in the Europa Conference League um, at the end of last season. I wanted us to get in that spot. What is your opinion on the Europa Conference League? Because a lot of teams say, oh, we don't want to be in that. But of course, when you when you saw West Ham go on to win that competition, it's There's a trophy at the end of the day, isn't it? That's your answer. Look at that. Look at what Villa will be like if they win. Look at what Mourinho was like when Roma won. You know, come on. It's a trophy. Go out and, you know, why wouldn't you want to try and win something? Particularly when... If, you, if you're the English representative in the Europa Conference League, the Conference League is now, they're taking Europa out of it, you're the best team in it. Yeah. Because you're the representative of the strongest league in the competition. So you go in automatically as the best team. It's up to you. You've, got, you've then got to prove it. But you're the team who should win it because you're the best team. You have the highest coefficient ranking. You've got the, you're representing the best league. You've got better players than anybody else. Go and win the thing. Yeah. It also Martin gives you a a shot into the, the, the next you're guaranteed then if you win it into the Europa League yeah at least again another competition it's about winning things it's about trying to to get silver the first trophy is always the hardest yeah uh, you, you, you surprised me the, actually you can't win the second or third until you've won the first yeah I thought I thought you would say no we don't want to be in that you no, surprised no, I me in Europe. I, I think it would have been a problem this year because the squad is yeah. deep yeah but 
for a club of Tottenham stature, 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 blah, uh, with 60,000 supporters, with the fifth or sixth biggest wage bill in the country, not being in Europe is a staggering underachievement. Mm. Being in the top four is an overachievement. Not being in Europe is a staggering, unacceptable underachievement. And yeah. I know there are exceptional circumstances. And to be honest, if he hadn't blown the club up last season, they'd have finished fourth. It was the manager's responsibility for them. Conte was, in my mind, pretty much solely responsible for the mess of the club. You can blame other people. You can blame. It was down to him because he had a job to do. And he didn't do it. He did it in dereliction of his duties. And if he'd gone to Daniel in February, he said, look, I'm really sorry. Four of my best mates have died. My heart's not in it anymore. My family are at home. I need to go home. I'm really sorry. I've just got to go. Let's talk about compensation at the end of the season, but I've got to go. The season would have finished very differently. Mm -hmm. he, he, he just basically put a car's worth of gelling night in the middle of the club, lit the blue touch paper and walked away. And for me, that was utterly scandalous and unacceptable and unforgivable because he didn't need to do it. He's Antonio Conti. He's not some no mark who, who got the job and uh, and did and it was out of his depth. He's one of the world's greatest managers, and he deliberately struck me, destabilized everything, and that unconscionable really was. Yeah, Martin, with the January transfer window coming up and Spurs uh, almost desperate to sign players now, um, what sort of window do you expect? Uh, because as I said, you know the recruitment was good in the summer. Do you expect, you know, vast improvements in in January? And uh, I know I know we've already touched on possible players going out the door. I can't really see players going out the door now with the injury problems that we've got. You mentioned Hoybier and and the likes of Eric Dyer. Perhaps they would have moved on. Perhaps they're not going to now. Um, but what do you think, as a bare minimum, we need in this window? Two centre halves, two holding midfielders, or two central midfielders. And ideally a striker, but we're not going to get all five. So what's realistic? One centre half who can play, because you can always play Emerson there. I think he's all right. So Emerson can be the fourth centre half, or the cover right back, or whatever. Davis can then be the fifth centre half. Dyer can go if you get one in. Um, that's all right because you've also got you know if if they rate Phillips as much as we told they do, then he comes into into the rotation as the season goes on as well. Uh, definitely a midfield body of quality. At, with the ability to get up and down the pitch because we need to have cover for those who are missing. And I would like a, a forward player, ideally a central striker. For me, those are absolute imperatives. Don't need fullbacks. Uh, don't need wingers because you've got options there at the moment. You've got Solomon coming back. Um, that Kulisetti can play wide. Stone can play wide, etc. There's not. That's not desperate. Um, Johnson can play wide. So we've got those options. And um, Johnson needs to be a bit fitter. He's clearly struggling after the injury, but I still think there's something in him. I think uh, you can see he's a real player. He's good. So if they're not going to sell Richarlison, then he comes into the mix as well. So it's, but I don't think he's ever going to be the natural nine you want. He doesn't, he's not a hold a ball up nine for me. He's a runner in behind striker. So those are the three absolute necessities for me. And I think realistically, in, even in normal circumstances, three is as many as you're ever going to get. In January, yeah, absolutely. Uh, as you mentioned at the start of the show, uh, Benton Kerr and Kulisewski, you know, two fantastic signings in a January window. You know, will that happen again, you know, to make such an impact on, on, on a team season? It was well, simply you, you incredible. I can't they will. But if you buy players of the right quality, there's a chance they will. Well, with the quality, that's what I wanted to ask. With the quality, uh, under Postacoglu now, because for Cario, when we signed him, people were criticising, saying, oh, who's this? You know, we wanted David Raya. Uh, you know, we've gone for the cheap option, blah, blah, blah. And now when you look at it, he's actually a very capable goalkeeper, very good goalkeeper. Everyone's very happy. Van der Ven, some people question Van der Ven, uh, the signing of him. Um, the, the, the signings going forward for you, Martin, would they be players that have been there, done it, got the T-shirt and are proven? Or will it be players that 
perhaps not a lot of people in England, if we do go abroad to, to buy them, that is, um, you know, that we don't really know and they are players for the future. I think you want them in the early 20s profile athletes who are going to grow and improve. Look, he may well go and get um, the boy he had at Celtic, Jota, because he's available. He's not playing in Saudi. Yeah. That may well be a good, a, a, a quick and easy solution to problems, particularly if there's a swap involving Richarlison and us getting more money. Happy days, you know, those sort of things, additions. But I think you've got to get, you don't want too many players who are 27, 28, 29, because that's not the future. The future of the club is 22, 23, 24, who are there for, who, who if they're good enough, are there for four or five seasons, because then they grow together as a unit. Now, most of those players there are actually quite young. If you look across the, the profile, yeah. the players, he, Madison's probably the oldest of the ones he signed, and he's not exactly old, is he? So, and also he was ready to the step up to join a club bigger than Leicester. He was ready for it. It's about, you know, picking the the mix has got to be right. You've got to have a, you've got to need a couple of, of wiser heads in the squad because if you have too many kids, fresher gets to them. You need someone who can calm them down, which is why you might want to keep Hoberg or Dyer in the squad just for for that, actually, if nothing else, to just calm things down when it's getting a bit hectic, whether on the training ground or even on on a match day. These sort of things are really important. The, the chemistry within a unit within the squad is is pretty important. We keep being linked with uh, Bournemouth centre back Lloyd Kelly. Do you think he'd be good enough for Tottenham? I haven't seen enough of him. I can't say. I, I've seen him a couple of times. He looks big and he looks strong and he looks quick, and he he might be ready for it, but. I, honestly, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend. Oh, he's fantastic! I've sit, I, I haven't seen enough, and I, yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to criticise any of the signings when they make them. I'll criticise when they sign a bad manager, which they did four years ago with Nuno, the worst decision in the history of the club, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and that includes Christian Gross. It's really bad that um, we don't talk. We don't talk about Nuno on this channel, Martin. <laughs> but players. As you said, look, the, the immediate reaction to certain of the players they signed in the summer, oh, bloody, what they're doing, typical cheap option. Oh, he's really good. Come, yeah. Have a look at them first. You could, if they don't work, that's fine. But you can't can't be dismissive of someone before you've seen them play. That's wrong. Mark Gay is another one that we keep being linked with. Uh, of course, Crystal Palace centre-back. Uh, it appears, though, that they will want a hefty sum of money for him. Is that realistic? He's a really good player. I have seen him and I like him. Yeah. Um, I think he's very strong, he's physical, he'll give that ballast, he's good in the air, both ends, he's a threat. I, I would be not unhappy to see someone like that come in, because you know, I've seen him play a bit, I, I think I'm better able to judge, looking at him playing for England, he looks very composed as well. He makes the odd mistake, everyone does. And if you play for Palace, you're under more pressure. So it, it's harder, because you're constantly having to defend, you're more likely to make those mistakes. We keep the ball. So he'll have more time to think about his game as well. I think he would be a genuinely good signing were they to be able to, to get him. But as I said, as you said, Palace don't sell on the cheap. And Steve Parrish is definitely not going to sell on the cheap to Tottenham. Why would he? You know, yeah. if if the if they if they want to keep the player, you've got to give them money that they can't say no to. That's that's perfectly reasonable and valid. I've got no issue with that whatsoever. Martin, what have you made of Giovanni Lo Celso's career at Spurs? Of course, signed for us in 2019. Uh, been there under various different managers at the football club. Gone out on loan a couple of times. Uh, started the game uh, against Aston Villa on Sunday. What have you made of him? And do you think that he can be a mainstay in this team in, in the future under Postacoglu? There have been times when I thought that my backside side makes more impression on my chair than Lo Celso does at Tottenham. Um, did all right on Sunday. but. Come on, heart's not in it, is it? It's not. I don't. I, I don't see it. I don't. I don't see. I don't see him making it at Tottenham. That's that's why I asked the question. Well, I thought. He, I thought he did well. He did. And never. You never know. There've been fleeting moments where you think it's a player there, and ten games later, you you forgot. You've forgotten that because that player but hasn't shown. He's been injured. We, and he's not we've had that with Andombali, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. And Andombali was was a disgrace. I'm afraid. How you can be a football player and not be fit enough to last 60 minutes is utterly yeah. beyond me. Um, yeah. that's, that's his own fault. But he, then again, that was bad due diligence by the club because, you know, maybe they should have asked someone at Leon about his training. Because mm. apparently that's an issue there as well. 
and it's been an issue at Galatasaray, it was an issue at Napoli, Where, wherever he's gone, it's the same issue for the coach. He's not fit enough to play. There you go. I don't think that's the issue with Lo Celso. I just think he's... When the going gets tough, you feel he goes shopping, doesn't he? That's the that's yeah. the problem. You know, he's not the sort of player who's going to really roll up his sleeves and say, right, come on then. It's not in his nature. Yeah. He's, he's, a, he's an Argentine ball player. He wants to have time and space. And on a nice day, when there's loads of space, he'll look great. Is he going to get you out of a real hole? I'm yeah. not sure. I think you look at Madison and you think, actually, he wants to get you out of a real hole when he's on the pitch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Completely different attitude, yeah. Um, is there any... No, his English is great. It's not that. It's like the player. There's, there's plenty of English players who I thought they don't want to... They, they can't be bothered. They're not up for yeah, it. Yeah, well... Enough. You know, it's the player. Yeah. Well, it's also had a lot of injury problems as well. And uh, I, I read reports in the last... 48 hours that Ondon Bele has knuckled down now. He's lost a bit bit of weight and perhaps oh, he's got yeah, a future yeah. at Galatasaray. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you yeah, never know. Yeah, uh, yeah um, good <laughs> <laughs> Martin, I wanted to ask your opinion about the FA Cup because um, the FA Cup means a lot to me. Um, you know, I remember when we when we won it for a record eighth time in 1991. Of course, Postacoglu made 10 changes in the League Cup. Whether you agree with that or disagree with that, there's been lots of debate on this channel amongst Tottenham fans about whether he made the right decision, decision or not. Uh, for me, I was a little bit disappointed. But the FA Cup, do you think that Postacoglu will take the FA Cup seriously and that will be uh, a priority for Spurs this season? Well, he can't make 10 changes because he hasn't got 10 players. <laughs> Good. Good. So I think he will. I think, yeah, I think he'll see. Look, it's six matches to win a trophy. Yeah, six matches. It's not that many, is it? You know, they they look at the start of the season. They won six. You know, six on the spin. You win something. That's well, it's six matches over over four over five months. Doesn't yeah. mean you're gonna. But yeah, you try and win the thing. You know, look, if you've got if, if you've played if your first 11's played every match and they're knackered and you've got options on the bench, it's one thing. When you've got no options on the bench, you might blood a couple, but you're going to play eight or nine of what of what you've got as your best play. Also, who are they playing? The draw. If they got City away, it's a bit different. If you've got Morecambe at home, you know, let's see, you, you don't no one knows what the draw's going to be, do they? But I would want no. to try and win it, yeah. Do, do, do you know what, though? Fair fair uh, play to Postacoglu because he made 10 changes against Fulham. We still didn't lose the game. We lost on no, penalties. And and the amount of changes, you know, forced by injury and suspension on Sunday, you know, we still give Aston Villa a good game and perhaps should have gone on to, to win the game. So fair play to him for, for getting... If we played at Fulham like we did at Villa, against Villa, we'd have won that game easily. Yeah. But yeah. I was my concern really was that Fulham home game in the league actually when he made the changes in the last ten, it was pretty shambolic. I know they had mm. another game on the Friday which they went won at, at Palace, but the players who came on suddenly took the level down by more than they should have done. And the trouble yeah. is, the players who came on are the ones who are starting now, of necessity. Yeah. Martin, is there anyone so far this season that has surprised you in terms of giving more quality than than you thought? I've been very impressed with Porro, actually, because he's looking like the player we thought. And I love the way he comes for the ball and he makes the odd mistake, but I like it and he's inventive and he's got a really good delivery. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how good he, whether he was going to be good enough, and he has been. Yeah. Uh, I was very confident about from what I'd seen and heard about Udogi. I didn't know what to expect from the centre half, but he's been brilliant. But you know, the starting eleven or thirteen, if you go through it, they've all played really well, apart from yeah. arguably with Charlison. Yeah, I agree. He's really good. So why would you be critical of, of any of them? And I think whenever he's played, I think Emerson's done really well. I, I genuinely do, and I and I like the way he's knuckled under, to, except in his status as a as a reserve. He's not a starter. But whenever you call on him, that the, some of those blocks he made against um, against Fulham when he came on and against Chelsea, see how much it, me it meant to him to make those blocks. Now, if you weren't bought into what was going on, it'd be very easy for him to turn. I'm a Brazilian. I, I'm first choice for Brazil. What do you mean? I'm not playing for your silly team. Well, you wouldn't know that from his attitude, would you? That's been really good. Really positive. Just on Richarlison. 
Uh, because I completely agree with you. That That is the only player, I think, this season that can really improve his game and certainly the goal scoring as well, because Kulisewski hasn't registered an assist so far in the Premier League season. And, and that's mainly down to Richarlison not putting the ball in the net when he was in yeah. centre. Um, do you think that he's a player that Postacoglu can work with and can improve? And do you think he will try and get the best out of him? I think he's tried all season. But trying a bit more. <laughs> It's up to the player, isn't it? It's up to the boy. Look, he's going to have... He's going to need him over the next... When he comes back from this operation, which hopefully will be in a couple of weeks, he's going to need him. And he's yeah. probably got five, six weeks until the middle of the window in January. Yeah. Move. And if he hasn't doing it, I think the decision will be made. Down to him. I want him... I'd love him to have a run of scoring goals, playing well. Yeah. Being confident, having fun, smiling, enjoying life again. I'm just not convinced I'm going to see it. And I really want to be wrong. I really want to be wrong. But I fear I'm not. Yeah, I always try and get behind. Well, I do always get behind these players. But, you know, sometimes sometimes it just doesn't work out, as you said earlier. Um, Martin, Is that what many... cool? It happens. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, many reports in the last 12 months about Spurs possibly selling up. Do you ever see this happening in the near future? Daniel Levy uh, selling uh, Tottenham Hotspur Football Club because there was a report out today from uh, BBC stating that um, there were talks, but Daniel Levy wanted too much money. Can you ever see that Spurs will sell up in the near future? Put three and a half million billion pounds on the table and they'll sell. That's the price, is it? Three and a half billion? I think, I think about three and a half billion, yeah. Then they'll get that, but that's, that, that's the price at which they start to talk, to listen. I'm sure. Uh, look, the owner who's not the owner, but everyone knows really is the owner, needs money. He has a very big bill to pay to keep himself out of jail at the age of 90 in the States, even though he's not the owner. We know, of course, he's not the owner. No, no, no. Joe Lewis is not the owner. He's the owner. <laughs> I mean, like, let's, let's be honest about it. He might want to cash in some of his assets. What's his prime asset that he can cash in? Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. If the, you know, they talk about in America about a franchise, a major franchise being worth eight to ten billion. He's not going to get that for Spurs, but it's it's the global sport. It's in the biggest league in the world. He's got a stadium and a training ground that don't need to be have a penny spent on them, apart from a lick of paint, for the next 20 years. He's got a very saleable asset there. And I'm sure that Spurs will have offers over the next 18 months. I know not where from. I know not who from. There'll be serious offers. It may be that that serious offer comes from the bloke who didn't buy Man United. Mm. Are you surprised that the um, stadium hasn't been named yet, bearing in mind that we moved there back in 2019? Yeah, I thought it would have been done by now. I think it would. I know they were looking for a front loaded deal. Um, they still insist they're looking for the right deal and the best deal. And also, the one thing I would say is you can only name a stadium once because when you try and rename it, no one remembers. Mm. So the premium is the first naming rights deal, wherever you go. So you're holding out. But it comes a point where it becomes too late almost. It won't become, it won't be the whatever it might be stadium. It will be the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Oh, they call it, what's the name of that sponsor? So you, it's getting to a point now where it's almost too late. Yeah. And I thought, I, I'm amazed that they didn't, they they haven't, but obviously this they've got a bloke whose job is to find the find the naming rights sponsor. That's his job. And he's, that's done it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure yeah. I, I think if i if you really go out, I think you can probably find somewhere. I think you can find someone. You know, let's let's get two hundred million in and then think, oh, we might have got another thirty. Let's get the two hundred million in first. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised I'm surprised it hasn't happened, if I'm honest. Um Martin VAR. Um, every single time Spurs play, I go out and buy most newspapers, read all of the articles. And I tell you what, this season, it has always been about VAR rather than the actual football. Um, what do you make of VAR, particularly this season? And what needs to change, in your opinion? If you still look, if you look at in the round, there are far more correct decisions now than there ever were before VAR. People fixate on the wrong ones, ones that get, they go wrong. And I, I get why, because people feel a gripe when something goes against them and it shouldn't do. But against Chelsea, every single decision on VAR was correct. We might not have liked any of them. In fact, the one that was wrong 
was that Dogie should have been sent off and not got yeah. a yellow card. Yeah. Um, so it's what is. On Sunday, every decision was correct. Don't have to like them. They were all correct. The vast majority of decisions are correct. VAR ensures that they are correct. What you do get is the people looking at the ones that are wrong, the mistakes. And they do happen. There's been too many of them. But there's still far fewer mistakes than there's ever been in a pre-VAR environment. Just people forget them in the past because it was in, in the past. In the same way, I keep on reading, oh, it's better in Spain and Italy and France. No, it's not. It's worse. Just go and ask the people in Spain and Italy and France and Germany what they think about VAR in their leagues and their referees. It's no different. Just no one reads their we don't watch Bologna versus Genoa or Grosser versus Stuttgart. We don't care what happens in there. We care about what happens to Spurs and what happens to Arsenal. So you fixate on the things you care about, not the things you, you don't care about. Um I think there are issues. I think it's a determination to get it right. I know the people involved. I had a long chat with Howard Webb last week um, when I saw him at the Premier League meeting. And he's not trying to pretend it's, a, it's, it's been great. He, he knows there's been mistakes. He's absolutely only There was one, I think, probably last night that, that did Wolves again. I think Wolves have been the unluckiest. They've had four or five shockers. Um, but the, the, has there been a bad decision against Spurs this year? No. No, no. Uh, well, uh, well, the they, they the, the, the main one. Sheffield United, and they won the game. Yeah, well, of course, the main one was that Liverpool game, wasn't it? But of course, we were on the right end of it. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, the decision was correct. They just messed up the telling the referee that it was yeah. that what the decision was. The decision, the VAR got the decision right. Yeah. They just miscommunicated what the decision was. Do yeah. Do you think? Do you think if all all twenty Premier League managers voted? to keep VAR or get rid of it, what do you think the outcome would be? It'd be a split down the middle. Because really? the one thing about VAR, from a manager's perspective, it means you concede fewer goals. And they all want to concede fewer goals. So anything that means they concede fewer goals, they were in favour of. A lot of them would be in favour of. Probably be 12 8 either way. Do, do you think there ever be, you know, like after the games, of course, the managers do the uh, post-match press conferences. Do you think they ever get to the stage where they will interview the officials, like the referee, after the game? And, you know, from your point of view as a journalist as well, would you like to see that happen? No, because all you'd be asking them about is the mistakes they've made. You'd never say to the referee, what a fantastic game you had today. That uh, advantage you played in the 35th minute, that was genius. Hey, and you got the penalty... They only get – they're there to be sitting ducks. That's not yeah. fair. That's not yeah. right. And we shouldn't go down that path um, what, at all. What about the commentary, about um, perhaps uh, the crowd listening to the commentary? Would you would you like to see that happen? Uh, irrespective of what I think, IFAB aren't going to have it. Not for at least five years. So mm -hmm. the best we're going to get is what we get once a month, getting the play out with Howard Webb. That's it. They're not going to do anyone. They will maybe give a bit more information. They'll have those announcements in the stadium about from the VR referee about the decision that he's overturned. I think you should have more information on the screen rather yeah. than checking the handball. It should be uh, VAR check, potential handball, Tottenham number seven. Yeah. Uh, offside, West Ham number three, whatever it might be. So, you know, so at least the fans in the stadium have more idea of what's being checked. And when we go to the semi-automated offsides next season, you'll get that graphic at the next stoppage of play on the big screen to show the offside decision, whether it was on or off. So that's coming. That's going to be a positive. That will speed things up because you won't have the interminable wait to draw the lines because they'll be done automatically by the computers. So it'll be quicker. They'll then be on the judgment calls, which most of them are 50-50 or you know, 60-40, and they can go either way. It'll be different. It'll be better. It'll be quicker. But some people will never be satisfied because most fans only want decisions that go their way. Of course, yeah, well, yeah. I've, can't, I've got to say, go I've got to say though, them. I've got to say though, Martin, go, going to the games is very frustrating sometimes oh, yeah. because pe <laughs> people in the stadium haven't got a clue what, what exactly, what's happening. That's the problem. There needs to be more information. Yeah, more information in the stadium. I think that's really imperative. That's the only way. 
Martin, wanted to ask you about um, Terry Venables, who very sadly passed away at the weekend. Uh, of course, Tottenham had a minute silence on Sunday before the Aston Villa game. Uh, you've been a journalist for, for many years. I'm sure that you've uh, covered Terry Venables uh, a number of times. Um, can, can, you, can you tell us any, uh, any stories about Terry Venables, any encounters that you've had? Well, Terry and I had, a, a, I think it's fair to say, a mixed relationship uh, going back over a number of years. But I covered him uh, at Euro 96 when he was England manager. I think I was the first person, there was three of us, the first people to interview him as England manager. There's myself, Rob King from PA, sadly no longer with us, and Mike Hart on the standard going back to when he, when he got the job and then trooped on Wembley to see him there. And Terry had his flaws, but as I've done a piece this week, ask anybody who played with him, for him, and they'd all say the same thing. He was the best manager I ever had. Yeah. Because he understood the culture of players. He understood the mentality. He wanted to be bright. He wanted to be inventive. He was innovative. He was a fantastic football coach. If he stayed as a football coach and tried not to do other things, I think he had a happier and better life. Um, and I think losing the England, England job robbed him of his soul in some ways. It was the worst thing that could happen to him because he spent the rest of his days feeling he'd missed something, he'd lost something. And that was a real shame. Uh, but I... I will always remember him because of that twinkle in his eye. There was something, even when you, when, I, I had some interesting discussions with him. We didn't entirely get on on everything for a variety of reasons, because you don't always get on with people. But I thought he was a brilliant coach. And I and he was fantastic company, engaging company. You sit around, you know, you'd have a drink in the bar at the Round Mail Mason in Leeds when he was there, and you could spend three hours talking football with him. And it was fantastic. Mm. You hung, yeah. you hung on his every word because you knew he cared. And that, and if he does that to me, he's a hard-bitten, cynical hack. What's he going to be like for a 20-something player who know, believes that this bloke can make them be better players? That's yeah. all you ever want. All you ever want is a manager who can take you over the line, take you to be better than you think you can be. And he could do that. And, he, and his prime... He was absolutely brilliant. And those England players, the likes of Southgate and Shearer and co from that Euro 96 squad, none of them would have a bad word said about him. And what better, greater testimonial can you have than that? Yeah, it's funny because before the Aston Villa game, Paul Allen, uh, of course Spurs legend, said that he never, ever noticed um, or heard him raise his voice ever in the changing room to, uh, to the Tottenham Hotspur team. Um, and... I've got to say, 1996, I remember it very well. I, I think that the whole country was behind the England team. And I, and I always say this, whenever England are in a tournament now, I would love to get that feeling back of Euro 96 because the whole country was behind that team. Yeah, and how, yeah. we didn't, how we didn't win that tournament that year, I will never know. Well, I mean, I would say, looking at it, they were actually, it was slightly mixed. There were two really good performances, two average performances and one absolute shocker. Uh, but everyone remembers the two really good performances against um, Holland and Germany, and they were fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Holland game was the most remarkable. That particular that period after half time was one of the greatest things I've ever seen in English. They were absolutely magnificent that night, and the Germany game was incredible. Could have gone either way. Ended up going there, were penalty shootout. That's the beauty of sport that you can play really well and lose, as we discussed about the start of the show. It was yeah. a really good team, but they had home advantage and they had some really good players. And they had a cause. And they were so close. Penalties so again. Because so sometimes it's not meant to be fair. You know, if it was meant to be fair, I'd be a lot taller, you know, and have more hair. And <laughs> It's not meant to be fair. It's, it's, it's life and things go against you. Martin, last couple of questions for you. Um, from what you've seen so far this season, who are you going to say that are going to get relegated? Oh, the bottom three. Who, who will they be? The bottom three not being Everton. The bottom three would be the bottom three if Everton didn't have the points deducted. Because I think I'll get a few of them back. So it's it's Sheffield United, Burnley, and Luton. With the, uh, with, the, with, the points, with the points deduction, what what realistically do you think is going to happen to Chelsea and Manchester City? I think Chelsea will get a points deduction at some point. And eventually, if the charges are proven against, it's different against Chelsea and say that because they've already admitted the charges. So we know that they did it. The question is what the punishment is. I think they'll get a points deduction. Man City are denying it. If the majority of those 115 charges against Manchester City are proven, 
I believe, and I've got no reason to, it's my, my feeling is that they will be relegated at least one division, if not two. Wow. But they've got to be, look, as I said, if the charges are proven, there is, you know, I, I don't know. They're insistent that they won't be. Who knows? I'm not a jurist. I don't know the ins and outs of it. I haven't seen the paperwork. But if those charges are proven, the punishment has to be more than just significant. A few points isn't significant enough for 115 charges. I think relegation is the most likely scenario. If when that will be, whether it's this season, next season, three years from now, who knows? That's mm. not in my hands, but that's what I suspect. Martin, what do you make of the um, the stories about the Jermaine Defoe uh, transfer and Spurs could possibly have points deducted uh, because of this transfer back in 2008? Well, anything's possible, but I would be extremely surprised. Mm. Um, it was it was investigated at the time, maybe not properly. Nothing happened then. Are you going to go back 15 years? Mm. Because if you do yeah. that, every trans every club in the Premier League may have a skeleton that will get unearthed. And that's yeah. no good for anyone. So you never know. And it's always possible. Could be proven wrong. I don't think so. I don't think so. Martin, final question for you. If you were to predict who will finish in the top four and where Spurs will finish at the end of the season? City win the league. Liverpool second. Arsenal third. Villa fourth, Spurs fifth. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Um, I mean, it's been a pleasure. Than that, and I think we could be, but I'll take that. I'll take fifth. Yeah. Well, it certainly depends how, how December and January go. And, uh, of course, the January transfer window, they, you know, there will be a lot of changes. There'll be a lot going on uh, during these next few months. So, Interesting times. Um, Martin, I could talk to you for hours about football, so thank you so much for your time. It's, it's an absolute pleasure having you back. Um, what are you up to in the next couple of weeks and where can people find you? Um, let's just turn that off. Uh, I will be going to Saudi for the Club World Cup in about three weeks' time, two and a half weeks' time, and I'm uh, on Twitter at Martin Lipton. And I'm in the sun most days. Not every day, but most days. Well, Martin, thank you so much. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. And until... The next time, come on you Spurs.